Good morning, church. As Terry mentioned, we really do want to remember in prayer all those folks whose lives have been devastated in North and South Carolina. It's hard to imagine being in a situation where you get over almost three feet of rain in just a few hours. How absolutely horrific that could be and will be and disruptive in the lives of so many people. So uh, please remember them in your prayers. I am sure opportunities are going to come for us to reach out and help the folks in those areas. And I would encourage you to uh, seize those opportunities as they come. Speaking of opportunities to make a difference in somebody's life, uh, our Magi boxes continue to build up here. And that's great. Um, next Sunday, right, Gene, will be the last Sunday that you can bring these boxes. And so if you haven't got yours filled or you'd like to fill some more, um, please see Gene or Rhonda and get those boxes. And we need to have those back by, by next Sunday because they've got to pack and transport and try to get those things down there by December. We were able to go out to Eddie Warrior on Friday. And God continues to... Uh, Bless that work in a great way. We baptized 14 ladies into Christ on Friday. Um, it's just so heartwarming and, and uh, faith affirming to see the power of the gospel in the lives of, of people like that as they listen to the gospel message and respond to that message and give their lives to the Lord. Uh, again, would you encourage you if you're not a part of that work and would like to be let Henry or, or Betty or Glenn know, and uh, we would love to have you as a part of that effort out there. We've been talking about the fact that Father knows best, and I really do think that God's reflecting is very much reflected in uh, what we now know as the Ten Commandments. The commands he carves into stone, gives to Moses, who in turn gives them to the people uh, in Exodus chapter 20 on Mount Sinai. Um, there are certain foundation stones that all of us have to have in our lives. If our lives are going to be as productive and protected, I think, as they could and should be. And I think you find summed up in the Ten Commandments uh, principles that all of us need to follow in our lives. In fact, really, I, I hope that you have begun to ingrain in your minds these Ten Commandments as you begin to memorize them, that they become a part of you. Um, I tell the ladies out at the prison, we always have a circle after we have baptisms and talk to them for a little bit. One of the things I tell them is, we're going to give you a Bible, but that Bible is not going to do you any good sitting up on a shelf or in a corner or stuck under your bed somewhere. The only way that Bible is going to impact your life and do you any good is if you open that thing up and read it and get those words into your head and into your heart so that they shape and direct your life. And I believe it's very true. And, you know, people can say, well, the Ten Commandments, that's great wisdom from God. It is. But it's only going to have an effect in your life if you have those words in your mind and in your heart and you really do let those words guide you. As we've talked about, the first four of the Ten Commandments have to do with your relationship with God. You aren't to have any other gods besides Him. You're not to reduce Him to some kind of image. You are not to take His name in vain. You are to, on a regular basis, remember Him and hold Him sacred. That's that fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The last six commandments have to do with our relationship with each other. Tremendous wisdom in what those commands have to say in regard to how we are to deal with each other. From the fact that we are to honor our father and our mothers to the fact that we are not to hold life as anything other than absolutely sacred. You shall not murder. Okay? You shall not commit adultery because that is destructive in so many ways. You are, as we're going to see today, to not steal. We're going to talk about that. And then I'll follow that up with not bearing false witness. And finally, touch upon the fact that we need to watch our hearts and make sure that we don't covet, that we don't want what somebody else has. Because if we let ourselves go down that path, that can lead to 
places that we don't need to go. And so this eighth commandment, you shall not steal. In the Bible, there's a very important concept. I would say it's pretty simple, but it's at the same time very profound. And that is that this commandment is rooted in the principle of personal ownership. There is my stuff and there's your stuff, okay? And it's important that we understand that. There have been some societies in the past, uh, political experiments and other things that have tried to say, no, everybody's stuff's everybody's stuff. Nobody has any personal stuff. Everything should be just everybody's. Doesn't work. Does not work. God knows that. It's not going to work. Motivation comes very much from you watching over, earning, taking care of your stuff. And me watching over and earning and taking care of my stuff. And it's important that those boundaries be established between what is my stuff and what is your stuff. And scripture very much honors that principle. In Deuteronomy 19 verse 14, as the people are about to go into the promised land, God's going to divvy the land up. He's going to divide it among the 13 tribes and give them specific portions of the land. And one of the instructions that he'll give is, I don't want you moving property boundaries. Now, just like we have fences, they had property boundaries. And in essence, what he's saying is, if a family in a given tribe has been given that land, don't you take that away from them. Don't you try to cheat them out of that. That is their land. And as you read the law, God's very protective of that concept. Again, there's my stuff and your stuff. You go to the New Testament. In Acts chapter 5, when Ananias and Sapphira, remember, sell this land they got and uh, bring the money to lay it at the apostles' feet, and they fib about it. They say, well, we're bringing all the money, and they don't. Peter will say in Acts 5, verse 4, while it remained unsold, did it not, listen to him, remain your own? It was yours. And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? There's that principle of you have your stuff. And you have the right to use your stuff in the way that you choose. Stewardship and the principle of stewardship in Scripture involves answering for how I manage what I own. In Luke chapter 12, in that parable of the rich fool, uh, God's holding that man to account because he misuses the stuff that he has. His focus is totally selfish. It's all on him. He's not thinking about anybody else or taking care of anybody else. He's just thinking about accumulating more and more of his stuff. And God calls him a fool for doing so. He does hold us answerable for how we manage what's been given to us. Now, you get down to theft, thou shalt not steal. Theft involves taking that to which I have no right. Okay? It's your stuff. And if it's your stuff, it's not my stuff. And I don't have any right to take your stuff. That's stealing. Now... Thou, uh, this, this commandment underlies the last five. And I want to just point this out to you real quick because I think, I think it's important and, and helps us to understand kind of the flow of what's going on. Uh, you shall not steal another person's life. That's the sixth commandment, isn't it? Thou shalt not murder. You shall not steal somebody else's mate. That underlies the seventh commandment. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal another person's property. That's the Eighth Commandment. That's what we're going to talk about today. And I say another's property as we're going to see. I believe this covers a number of things when we talk about not stealing. Um, you shall not steal another person's reputation. That's the Ninth Commandment. Uh, not bearing false witness. And the Tenth Commandment. Simply don't allow yourself to obsess over what somebody else has. Because when you do, that can lead you to, among other things, stealing, can it? And so you see that all these commandments are very much rooted in this concept of there's other people's stuff and there's your stuff. Honor that principle. Now, you shall not steal. This is an interestingly, I don't know if you thought about it or not, this is an open-ended commandment. 
God doesn't say, you shall not steal another man's ox, you shall not steal another man's wife, you shall not steal another man's house, you shall not steal another man's property. That's not what he says. He says simply, you shall not steal. What, you're, what you are not to steal is not specifically mentioned. In other words, what's he saying? All theft of anything is prohibited. Now, what then shall we not steal? Well, let me run through some things for you to think about when it comes to this prohibition of not taking other people's stuff. First of all, you are not to steal human beings. Um, very much in the old law, this principle is going to hold true that would prohibit kidnapping and prohibit slavery. Um, Exodus 21 verse 16, whoever steals a man, listen, and sells him, and anyone found in possession of him, shall be put to death. Now, if that's not a prohibition against kidnapping, if that's not a prohibition against a planned cold-blooded slavery, what is? There's a lot of misunderstanding, brethren, about what the Old Testament teaches about slavery and what God taught about slavery. And the fact is that it's very rigid in what it has to say about that. It's not as it's often misrepresented that, well, you know, you can just go out and kidnap people and make them slaves in the Old Testament. No, it wasn't okay. It wasn't okay. You do not steal another person's freedom. You do not steal another person. Real quick, there were slaves that serve people in the Old Testament. But oft times, if you'll go back and read, they were working off a of debt. And there was a time limit in which you could cause them to work off this debt. And then after that, it was mandatory that they be set free. There came a point, as the scripture will talk about, where a slave could be set free. And if that slave chose to remain with their master, that's the pierce my ear principle that was found there. But otherwise, you had to let him go. You did not own a person forever if you were a Jew in the Old Testament. It didn't work that way. And so this is a prohibition against stealing another human being. This is a prohibition against stealing their freedom, against treating them as property. You could not do that. This is also a prohibition against the theft of property. Um, I don't know if you've thought about this or not, but, but, but thievery itself is selfish. It, it, it's it's parasit a parasitic. A, a thief can only exist because of the work and efforts of others. You know, people weren't hard working and trying to be honest and accumulating things. A thief would be in trouble, wouldn't he? Because he wouldn't have anything to steal. A thief, brothers and sisters, is a parasite. He is living off the hard work and efforts of others. That's what he is and that's what he does. We'll talk more about this principle a little bit later. Um, you shall not steal a person's reputation. That's an important principle. When we get to the next command we'll talk about next week. You shall not bear false witness. And that's very much involved in, in stealing. You can steal somebody's good name, can't you? Uh, we have laws against slander. We have laws against libel. Because it's possible to steal somebody's reputation. To rob them of their good name. In fact, as we get more and more into political campaigns, what I believe we're going to see a lot of is one person trying to steal another person's good name, trying to muddy that name, accuse them of all kinds of things, play a lot with a lot of half-truths and quarter-truths and this kind of thing that we have to filter through. And that's wrong. It is wrong for me to sully your reputation. You see, that's one of the things about gossip that's so bad. Gossip is forbidden because gossip very often steals another person's good name. It sullies 
their reputation. It robs them of something that's very, very precious. And if you'll think about it, one of the most important things you've got is your good name. Is people's trust, is your reputation. You work hard to earn that, hard to hold on to that. And somebody can come along and lie about you and steal that from you. And that's a horrible thing to do. We are not to steal another person's good name. We are not to steal, if you've thought about this or not, we're not to steal their dignity. Uh, we see a lot of, there's a lot of humiliating today. A lot of, a lot of, of bullying that's going on. That's despicable. We are put on this earth not to dehumanize somebody, not to humiliate somebody, but to build them up, aren't we? To strengthen them and, and, and to encourage them and to help them in their lives. And the very opposite of that is when people set out to deliberately humiliate someone to degrade them, to bully them. It's wrong, okay? You are stealing something from them that's very, very precious, and that is their sense of self-worth, their sense of who they are. We've got no right to take that away from them. Also, you can steal a person's trust. Um, in Hebrew, the Hebrew word for deceive is literally stealing knowledge, stealing another's mind. There, there's a sense in which when you steal a person's trust, you steal their mind. Um, this would be involved in, in, in lying, for instance, about what you're selling someone. Oh yeah, I guarantee you, this car will run another 100,000 miles. And you know the transmission's about to go out. You know it is, and you want to dump that thing off on somebody else before the transmission goes out. What are you doing? You're stealing from them. Because you know good and well that you're selling them faulty merchandise, and you know that it's going to cost them money in the future that they may not have, that they're not intending on spending because they believe you. Because you're telling them that this product is okay, and it's not. I think on the news last night, they were talking about a fella who was being arrested and his parents because he had been selling bogus investments to folks had robbed them of over a million dollars and he's the thief and he's not only robbed them here because i've seen this happen before i've known people that this has happened to and he's not only robbed them of their money and of their trust but he's also robbed them in many cases of their retirement of their security, of the future as they had it planned, because he's taken from them what they had entrusted to him. He's stolen it and spent it, and here they are left with nothing. That's despicable. It's not right. He is a thief, okay? And God says, you don't do that to people. Um, manipulating another by lying to them about your motives or your feelings. You're stealing from them. We have a phrase, don't we? Oh, he stole my heart. You know, well, that can not necessarily be a bad thing, but very often it is. One of the very first funerals that I ever preached was uh, for a brother in Christ who died of bone cancer and in the last several months of his life I watched his wife Marilyn take care of Henry and she just did an amazing job of caring for him as he prepared to leave this life and and go on to the next one a while after Henry died this shyster took up with Marilyn very good very good lady 
But this guy just came in and he was just as slick, so slick if you touched him, you'd slide off, you know, in my opinion. And I wasn't very old, but I could see it, but she couldn't or wouldn't. And he talked her into marrying him and she married him and she was just beaming and she was so happy for about two or three months. And then she began to see what a character this guy was. And now he had lied to her. And by the time she divorced him, and it wasn't all that long after that before she did, he had basically taken everything the woman had. Not just her heart, but he'd taken her pride, he'd taken her hopes, he'd taken her dreams. He had taken her property. He was a thief. Okay? A thief who stole her trust. And that again is wrong. Okay? That's what's condemned in this passage. And again, I think that's why this command is open-ended. Why it speaks to a number of different things. Thou shalt not steal. Because there are so many ways in which we can rob other people. Come on, here we go. This one, I don't know if you thought about it or not, but I hope you will. You can steal intellectual properties. I'm talking about songs, I'm talking about books, I'm talking about plagiarism. Um, in recent years, you know, there have been a number of, of, of fairly famous columnists and thinkers and writers and this kind of thing who have lost their positions because they plagiarized material. Because it was proven that they were stealing their ideas, stealing their thoughts from somebody else who had put those down and not giving them credit. Now, if you use what somebody else, but you tell everybody up ahead of time, hey, I, I give credit to this person, but that's totally different. I'm talking about stealing something intellectual and taking credit for it. That's wrong. It's deceitful. Um, for years, you know, back, yeah, it's been what, probably 20 years ago, for years, people were stealing music right and left. Because you could go online and you could pretty much access just about anything that anybody had recorded. You could download it onto uh, your CD or whatever and treat it like it was yours. And the band or the performer who put that together, who was out a lot of money and a lot of expense, studio time, musician time, what time besides just the sheer inventiveness of their ability to write, they were stolen from. And so laws were made to keep people from, from doing that. Same thing holds with books and other intellectual properties. And I would warn you, it holds true with software too. That software has a license that goes with it. And if that software and that license doesn't permit you to allow other people to copy that software, you're stealing if you let somebody else copy that software. You're a thief. Now, if you have permission for people to use, like, make five copies and use it on various computers, that's, that's fine. That's legal. All right, that's right. But people have a right to protect their intellectual property. They have a right to make money off what they develop, what they designed, what they produce, the effort that they put into it. That's their property. And we steal if we don't honor those intellectual rights. And so please keep that in mind because I think it's very important, particularly in this day and age when more and more we're digital. And more and more people make money off of what they develop and what they produce and we benefit from it. They deserve to make a living off of that. And finally, we can steal from God. Um, in the book of Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, Malachi, or God through Malachi, is going to lament, will man rob God? Yeah, you're robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you in your tithes and contributions? You are cursed with a curse. For you're robbing me, the whole nation of you. Now remember, in the Old Testament, a tithe is a tax. A tithe was something you owed God. We live in a different realm today in the New Covenant. The gifts that you give to God are gifts. They're not a tax. But for the Jews, it was a tax. That tithe was a tax. They owed that to God. Now, here's the problem when you go back and read in Malachi. Here's what's going on. 
is it, it's not just the tithes that some people are trying to cheat God of, but it's when they bring a sacrifice. God was very specific. If you bring a sacrifice to me, I want it to be the best you've got. The best of your flock, the best of your herd, because that's what I deserve, and it is. And they're bringing to him blind lambs, and sick lambs, and lame lambs, and that kind of thing. And God's saying, would you bring your governor something like this as a gift? No, you wouldn't. Well, why are you bringing it to me? The principle underlying this is, God has richly blessed us, brethren. He has been so good to us. And we need to honor him in what we give back to him. Show him our appreciation for the wonderful ways in which he's blessed us. And can we rob him of that? Yes, we can. Should we? It's not very wise. If we are going to um, express to him, I believe, our thankfulness. And that's what this is all about. My check that I write, a couple of checks every Sunday, I ought to put on the note line, thank you, because that's what it is. It's a thank you to God. God, you've blessed me this week. You've made sure that I ate, put a roof over my head, allowed me to have this and that. Thank you. And I want to give back to you and show you my appreciation for what you've given to me. We owe God that thanks. And there's a very real sense in which we steal from him when we don't honor him like we should in what we give. Let me leave one last passage with you. This is from the New Testament, from the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. This is in the context of Paul giving to the Ephesian brethren um, some house rules about how they are to live. Okay? And one of the things he says is, Let the thief who no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. When you read in here, when you look in 1 Corinthians 6, the sin list, and then what God says about that sin list and about such were some of you. The fact of the matter is, brothers and sisters, we can't undo what we've done. We can't. Okay? If we've been dishonest, we can't undishonest that. We can't. But we can't from this day forward be honest. We can't from this day forward do the best we can do to honor God and honor this principle. And one of the things that means is, because again, I would go back to a thief is a parasite. When people steal their parasites, they're sucking life from somebody else. They're taking things that they didn't work for, that they didn't earn, and no. The movies may try to make it funny. The movies may try to make it clever. It's not funny. It's not clever. Not if it's you that's getting ripped off. This afternoon, in our in our connect groups um, the video that I put together as the introduction for that I want to tell you about a good friend of mine who just had his identity stolen and the horrific consequences for him somebody he doesn't even know has no idea who this person is has really tried to ruin his life by stealing from him that kind of stuff goes on all the time listen to what Paul says if you've been to it don't do it anymore. Instead, here's what God wants from you. He wants you to become a contributing part of society. He wants you to work and earn. And he wants you to be able to take what you've got and share that with others. Make a positive difference in their lives. Instead of ripping people off, doing quite the opposite. Making a positive difference in what's going on with them. It's been so encouraging, and I'm sure you've seen the same thing. To watch these thousands of people have poured into North and South Carolina. And they're bringing their boats in. And they're bringing all kinds of supplies in. And they're coming just because they want to help. Because they want to make a difference. Okay? Because they know the devastation that these people are going through. And they want to do what they can to alleviate the, the misery. That's exactly what Paul's talking about here. Earning what you've got. So that with what you've got, you can help others when they need help. That's the principle that we need to follow. That's the bottom line. And thou shalt not steal. This morning, if we can help you in your relationship with God, further that relationship in any way, whether it's to begin that relationship as you're baptized into Christ, or if you've been struggling and, and you need encouragement, prayers, 
in that relationship, if there's any way that we can help you, won't you come? While we stand and while we sing. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood.